Hey everybody, it's Julie Spencer, author of the Bucks and Peak series, and this is Bucks and Peak book one, who is Ian Taylor, and we are now on chapter 11, and this is probably my favorite chapter. Uh, it is called The Almost Perfect Honeymoon. Okay. Megan forgot all about Ian's fame when she walked into the endowment room. There are no celebrities at the temple. Everyone wears white and everyone is equal in God's eyes. That wasn't to say they didn't take some precautions. They scheduled the marriage ceiling at the Detroit temple on a Wednesday morning, the least busy day of the week. The temple president had been aware he was interviewing a celebrity, but he was an old man and had no idea who Ian was anyway. To him, Ian was just another kid, trembling in his chair during the interview, about to go in and kneel across the altar from his eternal companion. President Jensen explained that he had seen hundreds of such boys, scared sick and excited beyond their imaginations. He had asked Megan and Ian questions about whether they understood the commitments they were making to one another and to God. He counseled them that taking care of one another in sickness and in health, excuse me, he counseled them about taking care of one another in sickness and in health and asked them if they were living the higher laws of the gospel, such as keeping the law of chastity and keeping their bodies clean from harmful substances like drugs and alcohol. Megan held Ian's hand reverently, and they both assured President Jensen that they were ready to enter into this covenant with God and with each other. Megan felt ready in a lot of ways. It had been a whirlwind few days since arriving in America. She had interviewed with her bishop and met with her stake president for a final approval to enter the temple, and they brought along only their two sets of parents. No one else knew they were getting married. There would be no fancy dinner or reception, no cake, no dancing, just a quick temple ceremony sealing them as husband and wife for time and all eternity. No cameras, no guests, and no one who could leak to the press who the, where they were heading on their honeymoon. After their interview with President Jensen, he invited them to proceed through an endowment session where they learned more about the higher laws and commitments they were making. Because Ian had served as a missionary and both sets of parents had been sealed in the temple years ago, they had already gone through these sessions many times over the years. But this was Megan's first time. It was special and sacred, and she was glad that Ian was there with her. They proceeded to the sealing room where Ian's father and Megan's father acted as witnesses, signing the marriage license alongside President Jensen's and Ian's signatures. As Megan lifted the pen to add her signature to that sacred piece of paper, a warmth ran through her heart. This was it. She was married. Megan held Ian's hands while kneeling at the altar and looked at him with every hope and dream for their future reflected back, in, reflected back at her. When they kissed one another for the first time as husband and wife, it was different. It was sacred and pure and filled with the love and devotion that they felt toward one another. Ian pulled Megan into his arms and held her as time stood still, and she closed her eyes and just felt the spirit that filled the room. When he pulled away from her just slightly and looked down into her eyes, he winked at her and grinned, and she knew that this moment and this love was going to last forever. Finally, Megan's mom and Ian's mom pulled them apart for hugs and congratulations. Ian hugged his dad and shook Megan's father's hand before his new father-in-law pulled him into a bear hug. Take good care of my baby. Megan heard the emotion in her father's husky voice and saw him dab at his eyes discreetly before shoving a white hanky back into his pocket. I will, Ian pulled away and looked him in the eye, man to man. I promise. They went outside for a few quick photographs in the gardens behind the temple, even though it was winter and no flowers were in bloom. It was still beautiful and Megan didn't even feel the cold. Megan's parents had made some additional arrangements that morning. They booked a hotel room in their own names, checked in, stocked the mini fridge, and brought the newlyweds luggage upstairs. When it was time to leave the temple, they handed the electronic key to Megan and Ian, who drove a rented black sedan with tinted windows around to the back of the hotel, ducked in through the back door, and made it up the elevator completely unseen. It was the first time they had ever been truly alone together. It was almost surreal. 
Ian took a deep breath and looked at his new bride, standing there in her white dress. He'd never put on a tuxedo, just a suit coat and tie, but he looked more grown up than ever, than, than Megan had ever seen him. They didn't race into each other's arms and fall onto the bed in a passionate embrace the way she'd envisioned in her juvenile dreams of what her wedding night would be like. Rather, he came to stand in front of her and took a deep breath, looking into her eyes. Mrs. Taylor, he whispered. Yes, Mr. Taylor. She grinned back at him, liking his sweet smile. Would you mind if we have a prayer together? He asked. It wasn't the most shocking thing he could have said to her on their wedding day, but it was a bit unexpected. Yet it felt so right. Gone was the rock star or the kid who traveled the world with his mates. <laughs> This was a man standing before her, who held the priesthood of God and took his temple vows very seriously. This was a man who had waited his entire life for this one moment to give away the one gift that could never be taken back. This was a man who wanted to kneel in prayer with his new bride and ask God's blessings upon their marriage. It was the most romantic moment of Megan's life. With tears in her eyes, she let him help her down to her knees and Ian held Megan's hands in his as he quietly spoke to the God they both loved. When he had ended his prayer, he looked her in the eye and leaned forward to kiss her very gently. That was it. She wrapped her arms around him and pushed him to the floor with a passion that neither of them had ever experienced, and the kiss never ended. After two nights in Detroit, the next stop was supposed to be the Northwoods Lodge near Petoskey on their way to the Upper Peninsula. What should have taken under four hours turned out to be a two-day trip with an overnight stay in Houghton Lake because they couldn't help stopping by the place where they'd met. They didn't bother going over to see Aunt Pat and Uncle Denny, but did decide to book a room at the Beachfront Hotel, even though the lodge where they had reservations was only an hour away. We should just stay here for a few weeks. Ian pulled away slightly and his eyes penetrated through the dark. I thought the idea was to keep moving so no one would recognize us, Megan answered him. She snuggled closer to her new husband and understood exactly why he wanted to stay, and it wasn't the beautiful view from the balcony. They'd be traveling through the upper peninsula of Michigan, never staying in one location for more than a day or two, and always checking in under Matt, excuse me, under Megan's maiden name before moving on to the next destination. There were no sightseeing or tourist stops, just one resort after another. They weren't all that interested in leaving the warmth and comfort of their hotel rooms anyway. Maybe next summer we can come back. Ian propped himself up on one arm to look down into her eyes. Sounds like a plan for next summer. Megan pulled him back down for another long kiss. Okay, this is the next section. They're at a different resort now. I have never been, nor do I ever plan to go, river rafting in the middle of the winter, Megan laughed, reading the promotional material on the desk at the Northwoods Lodge. Snowshoeing it is, then, Ian looked over her shoulder. I don't think so. My parents didn't go out of their way to find us the nicest honeymoon suite around so that we could freeze our toes off. Just think of it. Ian wrapped his arms around Megan's waist and pulled her toward him. The jacuzzi tub will come in handy to warm up those frozen toes. His soft breath against her neck sent a chill down her arms all the way to the tips of her fingers. Let's just skip the snow sports and go straight for the jacuzzi. That sounds much warmer. Okay, this is the next section. They're in a car crossing the uh, Mackinac Bridge. I want to see Mackinac Island. Ian craned his neck as they crossed the bridge into the UP. I've always wanted to go there. Not this time of year. Megan tried to keep her eyes on the road and her knuckles from becoming white as she braved the wind. A few knots stronger and they would have closed the bridge from traffic so as not to risk small cars being thrown into the frigid waters of Lake Huron. They stopped the ferries for the winter and only a few people actually live on the island year round. Can we make this trip again next summer? He turned to her with hope and expectation. If you come back to America, she laughed over at him. Do you know your tour dates for summer yet? Oh, I've no idea. He settled back into the passenger seat. That's Jeremy's job. My job is to stay in your arms as long as possible until they drag me back to Europe. 
Well, they're going to have to drag you from my arms to get you back to Europe. Megan looked over at him and immediately regretted taking her eyes off the road because she swerved just slightly. But not while I'm driving. Okay, this is another section. They are in the Cedarville Lodge. Happy New Year, Megan sighed. The Cedarville Lodge was the perfect place for them to stay for a holiday because it wasn't a party destination, just a quiet, comfortable, king-size bed in each other. Best New Year's Eve of my entire life. Ian snuggled into his bride's arms and fell asleep before the ball dropped in Times Square and the thousands of people waved to the cameras. Megan took the remote control from his hand and switched off the television with a contented smile. Best ever. Her voice trailed off as she drifted away. All right, now they're up in a town called Paradise, looking over Lake Superior. Paradise sure lives up to its name. Take a look at the view off this balcony. Lake Superior is incredible. Ian came up behind Megan to see where she was pointing, stood there with his arms around her for about a minute, then pulled her back inside. It's freezing out there. Ian shut the sliding glass doors to close out the wind coming off the bay. Sorry the Magnuson didn't have a king-size bed available. Megan tucked herself into his arms to warm up. Or a jacuzzi tub. What is it with you and jacuzzi tubs? She laughed at him. I couldn't care less whether or not we have a fancy tub. Well, I couldn't care less whether we have a king-sized bed. I'm not planning on sleeping more than an inch or two away from you anyway. Two whole inches? You're right, that is way too far away. Way too far. Megan pulled him even closer into her arms. <laughs> okay, this is the next section. Copper Harbor is one of the most unusual towns I have ever seen. Ian looked around as they were passing through on the way to the Mariner Resort. What do you mean? I don't know. I just like it here. Well, that's good because they're staying two nights. Cool. And the room has a jacuzzi tub. Yeah. Now you speak in my language. Ian leaned over and kissed her cheek. Your mom should planned us a nice honeymoon. Not bad for pulling things together at the last minute like that. Not bad at all, my beautiful wife. This has been the best honeymoon I've ever had. I'm pretty sure it's the only honeymoon you've ever had. Megan laughed at him and turned into the resort. Okay, this next section is really kind of fun. What happened to my hair? Ian cringed after having removed his baseball cap and running his hand through the mop that had grown out in the past three weeks since his tour had ended. Our stylist normally trims it up every couple of days. I look awful. You look amazing to me. Megan wrapped her arms around him, pulling him away from the large window in the truck stop where he'd been looking at his reflection. You're biased. Ian lowered his face to hers in a rare public show of affection. Normally, he rushed into the gas station arrest area, hat down, quickly used the restroom, and rushed back out to the sleek black sedan with the tinted windows got into the passenger seat and hoped no one had noticed him. So far, no one had, but this time someone did. A young clerk had been shocking a shelf nearby and heard the entire conversation. The British accent would have caught the attention of anyone in the UP, but the strange topic of conversation caused her to look over at the couple kissing near the restroom doors. The clerk gasped just slightly and her eyes widened. Panic trapped Megan in place for just a moment before Ian shoved his hat on his head and grabbed the keys out of her hand. I'll go start the car. You pay for the gas. Megan and the clerk stared at, e stared each other down, both with their eyes narrowed, daring the other to move first. Megan looked away and casually walked over to the counter with the Diet Coke she had in her hand and placed it where the girl could scan it along with the gasoline that had just filled up the black car at pump three. Megan wished she had $45 worth of cash in her purse, but instead pulled out her debit card and looked up as the girl stepped to the cash register. The young clerk smiled just slightly and reached for the card. Megan swiped it quickly on the pin pad and punched in her four-digit pin number. She panicked again when she realized that the receipt that printed would say her full name on it. Sure enough, the clerk grabbed the receipt and looked down at it confirming what she already knew. Thank you for coming in today, Megan, the girl stated in her most professional sounding voice. 
Megan grabbed the receipt from the girl and quickly turned to walk away. As she did, as she, did she heard the cashier mumble, luckiest girl in the world. Megan didn't turn around as she pushed the door open and listened as the hanging bells chimed to announce a customer coming or going. She almost ran out to the car and climbed in. Crap, Megan grumbled as she pulled out of the parking lot. We need to get out of northern Michigan immediately. Ian pulled his cell phone out of his pocket and dialed his agent's number. Jeremy, I need you to find me the nearest airport and charter us a jet now. The young clerk pulled her cell phone out of her pocket and used it to pull up the internet, where she found the website of none other than Stacy Smith. She scrolled to the bottom to find contact information for the blogger and typed in a quick message. I have information you'd be interested in. Please call me. She narrowed her eyes as she watched the black sedan pull out of the parking lot and hit send. And that is the end of chapter 10, the perfect, excuse me, the almost perfect honeymoon. And next we will go to chapter 11, Europe in springtime. Okay, we're almost done with the book.